I'm Brandon Dawson, and this is The Distiller. We are sitting on a beautiful Saturday early afternoon in mid-December on Cincinnati's west side at Westside Brewing. And across the table from me uh, sharing a beer is Matt Hart, who is, uh, I'm going to try to get all this in, the Associate Professor of Creative Writing and the Chair of the Department of Liberal Arts at the Art Academy of Cincinnati. Correct. Happy day, Matt. Thanks yeah, for, thanks good for coming. Good to see you. Good to yeah, see you. Awesome to be here. Uh, uh, Jim is going to step in here in just a second and talk a little bit about the beers uh, they brew here at Westside Brewing. But um, in the meantime, we're sipping on, I think, their uh, session IPA that he was kind enough to serve up to us. Um, and it is a lovely, lovely mid-December day. So yeah. I appreciate you coming out. Yeah, of course. Uh, the distiller, for people who haven't listened, is a podcast about the soul of work. Um, we say that it's about how you find meaningful work and how you find meaning in the work that you do. Um, Matt uh, is a poet who's lived in Cincinnati for, you said, 25 years? Just about. Just coming on? Yeah. 25 years there. And I'm actually really excited to talk to you because... Uh, my partner's a, a poet, Sarah Rose, that you know. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a poetry scene in Cincinnati like there's a poetry scene anywhere, but I sort of feel like you are an enigma or some kind of an anomaly in that scene, if for no other reason than that where you teach is uh, you're typically teaching creative writing generally to visual artists. Yeah, that's correct. And you said, just a moment ago, you said you guys just started... Uh, just got a BFA in creative writing okay. at the Art Academy. But it's, it's a pretty weird BFA in creative writing yeah. in that uh, the visual artists and the writers are not separate from each other. Right. They take all the same classes. And really, it's a, the way that we think about it is that we're sort of treating language as its own kind of artistic material. Right. Um, and so it's, it's the only program in the country where the writers and the artists aren't separate from each other. It's do you run f- out of an art school. Yeah, do you, like, do you feel like you're on an island over there in that you're a language person surrounded by visual people? Or do you, does, not, that, not, does that bother you at all? No, not really. I mean, actually, part of what I love about it, I mean, I have friends who teach at, in universities and English departments and, and creative writing departments. And um, very often they complain to me about the politics of, of that and the sort of territorial squabbles that come with. Because there that. are so many other people that do what they do. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have any of that. Also, visual artists tend to be people who are really interested in writing. Yeah. And really interested in reading. <laughs> um, and, you know, lots of people have said that, that all painters actually want to be poets and all poets want to be painters. And yeah, it, it, it feels a little bit true when I'm at school. Interesting. Um, so I feel like I have like, I have great colleagues that I can talk to about anything, um, including poetry, including mm-hmm. painting, sculpture, photography, whatever. I mean, it, that's, it's a part of my job. I can't believe it sort right of every day. Well, let's, let's step back a minute because I, <clears throat> I want to get into what your actual days are. But first, I want to talk about um, how you got to where you are and why you do what you do. So you, have, you come from a musical background. You yep. front, fronted a couple of punk bands. Mm-hmm. Do you still do that? Do you still? I still play, s- yeah. Do you? Yeah, I have a new band, actually. Okay, so, say yeah. more. Tell us about so it. So I have a new band. Promote he, your band. Here Come in on. Cincinnati <laughs> called Never New. Okay. Um, and we've been writing songs primarily for like the last couple of years. So we've got 26 or 27 new songs. Okay. Um, and we have a few songs up online on a Bandcamp page just so they can sort of be heard. They can just point. search Bandcamp for Never New and yeah, and find it? Yeah, and it's N-E-V-E-R, N-E-W, one word. Okay, cool. So, uh, but we've been doing that. We're going to, we're starting to play some shows now. Great. So, um yeah, it's it's fun. It's really noisy. It's pretty angular. Uh, it's melodic though, uh-huh. you know. So there's it's it's still got like a punk rock edge to it, but uh, it's not like it's not super thrashy, super fast. All right. It does feel like it might fall apart at any second, <laughs> which is how I <laughs> like my punk or the rock. music or yeah, all yeah, of it, yeah. the whole deal. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's push pause on that for just a second. Curtis is going to come in. Um, and tell us a little bit. Here, jump right in here next to Matt, Curtis. And first of all, thank you for letting us uh, barge in here a little bit early on a Saturday afternoon. No problem. Thanks for, uh, thanks for showing your support. 
Yeah, really, really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about uh, Westside Brewing. How long you guys been here? Um, you're on Harrison Avenue in the West Side. Super easy to find, right off the corner of Harrison and Montana. Correct. Yeah, we're right across from the Westwood Town Hall. Okay. Uh, we opened uh, June 30th. Our grand opening was just this past summer. Okay. Uh, so we've been operating for about five months now. Nice. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a project that started in, in 2015. All right. Uh, kind of a, a group around a fire, th- drinking beer, thinking about Were beer. you guys like home brewers before that? Uh, or? Yeah, I, I actually uh, home brewed with my father for um, about three years before we uh, kind of got serious about this. Okay. Uh, and then we, we started looking into uh, investment with, with uh, our two other partners. Cool. So you and your father, Jim, the co-owners, and then a couple of other partners. Correct. Uh, are Joe, they brewers? or Joe they... Mumper and uh, Brian Willett. Uh, no, they. Uh, I believe Joe Mumper did homebrew for a period of time. Okay. But um, no, we're, we're the two brewers of, of the owners. Cool. Well. And tell us about what you guys are making. Is there anything you, you particularly so specialize in? Our, our specialty is more just approachable uh, beers. So mm-hmm. nothing that's super over the top. We do make strong beers, which you'll be tasting today. Yeah. Um, but we, we try and keep our beers drinkable so that you can have a few pints and not have to worry about trouble getting home nice all right and tell us about what we're drinking we've got pints of the session ipa and then you brought over some tasters of the double yeah the tasters of our of our double ipa it's a it's a newer style recipe um so it's it's going to be a little bit heavier on the the hop notes uh-huh. than our session ipa uh clearly it's double the alcohol content yeah um but so you're gonna what get, is that in the in the double what so the the double is just twice the amount of grain that goes into the into right the but i mean what's the actual abv in this oh it's nine point uh, nine point seven okay so it's strong medicine yeah strong medicine for okay. uh for for a morning mm-hmm. um and then the uh the session settles in late you know the the higher four percent abv and they're both really good like for you know mid nines that's not that doesn't come across as super strong. Something no, it's, couldn't. it's got a nice balance. Uh, the hops are more tropical, fruity in, in nature, um, and it's a double dry hopped, uh, double IPA. That's delicious. What are for the the geekery in the room? Like, what are the hops in? So in the these bo- both of these styles, uh, we have a traditional hop, and then we have more new age hops. The new age hops are Mosaic and Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um, those are are used in in the double IPA. We've got a little bit of a Galaxy kick in the session, just as a, a very late dry hop. But the, the base hops are our traditional, the four C's. So we have Cascade, we have a little bit of Columbus in there. Uh, and then I believe the double IPA has some Simcoe. Nice. As well. Really good stuff. Thank you. Really, really appreciate really it. Thanks no for problem. letting us in. And uh, I should say, I mean, your space here is a great neighborhood event space. I can imagine. It sounds like there's stuff going on even later today. Correct. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a few... Um, associated businesses down the street that mm-hmm. we try and partner with as much as we can to get the Westwood Business District yeah. as much uh, site as it can get. And uh, Wooden Hill will be doing an art show here uh, this afternoon. Nice. Um, and we've got, we coordinate events uh, with the other businesses quite often. Love it. So not just a come in and drink a beer space, but a community space, a family space. Correct. Yeah, we're family friendly. You said friendly. you had dogs in here a couple of days ago? We have Wednesday night is dog friendly night. So this past <laughs> Wednesday was Santa Paul's. So we had about 60 dogs in here getting pictures with Santa Claus. Awesome. Wow. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, Curtis, Jim, thank you both for letting us in today. Really appreciate it. And thanks for the beers. They're delicious. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we were talking, uh, by the way, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for joining me. Really nice to see you. Good to see you. So I'm interested. um, I mean, the, you know, your, your punk rock past is it is an interesting feature by itself. I'm interested in anything that you want to talk about about that, but I'm also interested in how that informs what you do now. Obviously, you're still doing that, but like your, your day job is as a poet. So tell me, first of all, talk about, um, I would imagine that that comes fairly early. When were you first starting bands? When were you singing in punk bands? Yeah, I started playing in bands when I was 15. Okay. Uh, in? Evansville, Indiana. All right. So I grew up in Evansville, Indiana. There wasn't a lot of punk rock in Indiana in, in uh, you know, the, the early, mid 80s. Right. I remember, uh, if I can just, uh, I'll just tell this story. But there, so, uh, you know, in the in the early mid '80s in Indiana, especially in s- Southern Indiana, yeah, uh, we had metal. Uh-huh. Like everybody listened to metal, right? So good mid Midwestern. That's mid, right. Mid '80s metal. That's right. And so there was a. Uh, I remember that th- that I was in band at the time. I played saxophone, and there was a there was this young woman named uh, whose whose name I yeah her name was Angel Adamski. <laughs> she moved from New York City to Evansville. To Evansville. For, for folks that don't know and, and don't have a map next to them, Evansville is what? Two and a half, three south, hours south of Indy? 
Yes, about three and a half hours south of Indy, southwestern tip of the state. Yeah. Closest, so, I mean, uh, just like St. Louis is how far away from? Uh, two or three hours. Okay, so not entirely isolated, but a little bit of an island there in the Midwest. Yeah. Flatland. It's, it's actually kind of hilly because the glaciers didn't come down quite that far. Okay. It's pretty, it's pretty hilly, but um, uh, yeah. I in mean, the 80s, I, I just can imagine a teenager in the 80s in Evansville is feeling pretty isolated from the cultural forces you, you, and the rest of the world. You could, for sure. Okay. Uh, and so I, I remember talking with Angel about music, and I was really geeking out on whatever the bands were at the time, like Motley Crue. Yeah. Um, and she said, wow, man, you know, if you like this, you've really got to hear this music I have. Okay. And I was like, okay, cool. So she comes to school a couple of days later, and she has a 90-minute cassette tape. She made you a mixtape. And on one side of the tape is the Dead Kennedys plastic oh, surgery disasters, yeah. and on the other side is Black Flags damaged. <laughs> and I remember going home That's after school, you know, and putting, oh. putting that in, and the very first thing that you hear yeah. on the Dead Kennedys plastic surgery disasters is that just cacophonous racket yeah it's like and i had my head blown off yeah uh and i remember very shortly thereafter my mom came running downstairs and said you know what the what on earth are you listening to <laughs> uh and i was totally hooked yeah um and also you know the the you know as i mentioned before like the music sounded like these bands were together, but it was also really dissonant. It was really clattery. It sounded like things might fall apart at any second. I mean, Jello mm -hmm. Biafra's voice is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Rollins' so voice is ridiculous. Matter. The subject matter yeah. was, you know, I'd never heard anybody talk about yeah. um, politics so directly in a song. I'd never heard people talk about um, oppression and justice and uh, yeah, it was really, really immediately eye opening for me. So I started playing in bands and, um, f you know, fast forward a few years to college. I went to college at Ball State in Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. I studied philosophy because I couldn't figure out anything else I really wanted to study. Yeah. And while I was there, I took a poetry class. Um, and I took it on a lark because I thought it would help me write better song lyrics. I mean, the band was going strong at that point. What was that band? We were called Freaks of Nature. Okay, nice. And um, this poetry class was really amazing and eye-opening to me. But there were these young guys in the class who called themselves the smaller Midwestern poets. Uh -huh. And they would put on readings around campus. And I remember... They put on this reading, and for whatever reason, they liked me, so they started inviting me to these things. And I went to one of them, and there's this young guy. He had a beard and a flannel shirt on, and uh, stood up in front of everybody and said, and he was all of like 22 years old, yeah. you know, and said, I've decided I'm no longer going to read any of my poems in public. I'm only going to read the work of other people. Tonight, I'm going to read two poems by Etheridge Knight. And this one's called Feeling Fucked Up. Uh huh. And just launches into it. And I remember thinking, that's a poem? You can do that? Like, you can do that? Because, yeah. you know, the poem, that poem begins, Lord, she's gone, done, packed up and split, and I with no way to make her come back. Bright bone white, crystal sand glistens, dope death dead, dying and jiving. Drove her away, made her take her laughter and her softness and her midnight sighs. And then from there launches into this litany of FUs to yeah. everything but to Coltrane and alligators and birds in the sky and Nixon <laughs> and Mao and Nkrumah. Uh. And, and then at the very end, he says, you know, Fuck the whole motherfucking thing. All I want now is my woman back so my soul can sing. Oh, wow. And so, the, you know, the thing I responded to at the time was the sort of ferociousness of it, mm -hmm. the irreverence of it, the, the irreverence of the language, um, and, and, and the volume, the, the violence. The punk rock. The punk rock yeah. edge, right? But, you know, now it's like all these years later, I, I, and ha having studied poetry, like, it's a prayer. Lord, wow. she's gone, 
done left, done packed up and split, right? And, and at the end, it's this sort of plea for things to be, to be, to be righted, to, to, yeah. to have I just the, want her back. the beloved back, right? Yeah. So that whole, all that litany of FUs in the middle is somebody who's in total pain throwing a fit. Yeah. Right. And stomping around. And you can actually hear like the clatter of that language, bright bone, white crystal, sand, glistens, dope, death, dead, dying and jiving, all those hard consonants, you know, banging around. And that just like it changed everything. Hmm. And the next day was the first time I sat down to try to write a poem without a prompt, without anybody asking me to write one. Yours. And I've been doing that pretty much every day for, you know, 30 years plus. Um, and if, I mean, it was, it was monumental. I mean, it was a conversion experience. Yeah. 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 You know, um, and, and I talk about conversion experiences a lot, like with my students only because, um, you know, I grew up in this like sort of non-denominational Christian church with, with congregational singing and uh-huh. hellfire and brimstone preaching and, uh, I always, you know, I still, I love those hymns, uh, the hymns that we, that we would sing. And I actually am really sort of floored by the preaching itself. Mm-hmm. Not, not what they're saying, but sort of how they're saying it. And uh-huh. that's become kind of a part of my own aesthetic when I read my poems. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is my great 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 grandfather, the Reverend James Hart of the Folsomville, Indiana General Baptist Church, wow. for 50 years, stipulated in his will that at his funeral he should be stood up at the pulpit in his coffin with his eyes open, staring at the congregation. <laughs> I had another grandfather, a great grandfather, who uh, was walking home from a bar on New Year's Eve in Boonville, Indiana, mm-hmm. passed out in the snow and died of exposure. So I come from this sort of long line of really weird preachers and drunks. Right. And, and you know, the difference between being like a, a, a hellfire and brimstone preacher and somebody who's just like completely out of control, drunk, and somebody who's like throwing themselves around on a stage as a punk rocker, mm-hmm to shake themselves out of themselves, which is what I tried to do like over and over yeah. again. And being this, being a, a poet, I, like, I don't think those things are very different from each other. No. There's, there, there are a lot of connections. So in some way I feel like, you know, like I was, in, I was destined somehow to like be this. Like this was the thing that like, this was the thing that called, that called to me. It's the thing like that I, had to do. Um, so, you know, I started, I started writing poems when I was like 20, I didn't start until I was 20 or 21. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wrote poems all the rest of the time. I was an undergrad and then I went to graduate school briefly in philosophy. I studied the later Wittgenstein at Ohio University, which I loved. It cured me of philosophy. <laughs> um, and after that, I left there, and then that's when I moved to, to Cincinnati in, in 93. Okay. And um, started playing in bands, worked at a bookstore. Why'd you move to Cincinnati? I moved to Cincinnati because I had some uh, friends from my undergraduate days who were from here. Uh-huh. And um, I was still in a band with some people that were in Muncie. Yep. And... Uh, Cincinnati was halfway between Muncie and Athens. There you go. Ohio. Yeah. So we would meet here and rehearse. And because of that, I got to know the city a little bit. Uh-huh. And, I, and I liked it. And there was no way I was going to go back to Indiana. Yeah. Um, so I, I ended up here. Um, and, you know, I love it. 93 you moved here. I moved here in 93, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, man, there's so much that I want to dive into. It's really interesting, like... I think the first time that I met you, um, we had a brief conversation. I come from what sounds like maybe a little bit of a similar background of fairly non-denominational evangelical churches from a different part of the country. And I think I was telling uh, Sarah Rose, like there was something in your vibe 
that I couldn't put my finger on that was like uh, evangelical, not in the sense of like the capital E political religious movement, but there right. was exactly what you just described, which was like, uh, there's a bunch of words that I sort of wrote down and sort of trying to get my head around what it was. Like there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an ecstatic, with a capital E, like mystic vibe to what you do. There's, a, there's an evangelist or an evangelical vibe in the, in the verb sense yeah. to what you do. There's a, there's a fervor to what you bring to, their, to your stuff. And it's not just in your writing, although it's, it's all over your writing, but it's also just in who you are and how you deal with people. There's, a, there's an earnestness, and what, um, what strikes me as sort of like a desire for a level of interaction um, that felt very familiar to me from that world, and that was one of my first questions was, and you just hit it, was, was is that a religious impulse? Because, God, it sure feels familiar to me Yeah. from that world. Yeah. It just felt like a really familiar tone, and I was interested to know what that impulse came from. I think you've talked about that a little bit. Yeah. It, um, as much as you want to talk about or not want to talk about, like, what does the, there's a, there's at least a, uh, a sort of historical spiritual influence that comes through that. What does that mean to you these days? Is it, um, does it have a name to it? Is it? Uh, n no, I mean, it doesn't have a name, but, but the, but the thing that I'm reaching for somehow is um I, I i feel like like i feel like our art the, the art we make mm -hmm. the, and the, and the ways that we use our imaginations to to render the world in terms other than it is is better than we are and better than the world mm. um you know I, I, I always, I feel like, I feel like my palms are better than me. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and yet like the, the art provides a roadmap. Um, imagination provides a roadmap and it provides a roadmap to lots of things. I mean, it provides a roadmap to transcendence, right? But it also, it provides a roadmap to empathy. The, the, you know, imagination is the fundamental basis of empathy. Yeah. Because Being able to imagine yourself in somebody else's absolutely situation. Yeah. Um, so I'm always thinking about that in my, in my poems. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it sound though, you know, it's funny cause it makes it sound like the poems are like super mystical. And I don't think that they, I, I think that the poems are, very often they're very ordinary. They're very everyday. Like they start with like whatever's right in front of me. So if I were going to write a poem right now, yeah, I'd be writing about, you know, this beer and these microphones and the glasses that the beer is in and the color of the beer and the table that it's on. And because I, the, I don't, I don't start with an idea. I start with whatever's right in front of me. But that's the nature of the ecstatic is bringing the mystical into the everyday experience and being willing to recognize there's something going on there's here that we're here. not recognizing. That's right. There, and there are, <clears throat> as Coleridge said, there are more invisible things in the world than visible things in the world. Yeah. And that, that art allows us to get to those invisible things to, to, and Coleridge talked about clothing them in symbols. Hmm. So it's like you, you, if you can, if you can tap into the, to the invisible yeah. energy that's out there, as an artist, you clothe it in symbols that people can sort of wrap their right. wrap that you and other people can wrap your mind around and be surprised by, yeah, and and be in wonder about, yeah. Part of what I love about that is I value what you do um, deeply. Um, the culture doesn't seem or doesn't know that it cares or doesn't know how to care about poetry. Uh, what we invest in and sort of like, you know, how poets make a living and how they find a way to the whole academic world of poetry and how academia treats people in general. Anyway, yeah. Um, like, I feel like I want to say to people, God, if you want to, what you listened to, to 
punk rock for when you were a teenager, whatever you listen to now, whatever it is that you do that sort of shakes the snow globe of your brain to get you into an other experience that breaks you out of it, that it can accomplish that. Um, uh, often I say like the poetry, whatever, whatever I come to, um, whatever type of poetry it is, if it moves me, it moves me because there's fireworks. There's some kind of, whether they're quiet or they're loud, there's something in there that I didn't expect. There's something that kind of fucks with my understanding of the way things are. Yeah. Um, and it can be something like, like, you know, what you were just quoting, the bombast and the consonants yeah, right. and an attack. Right. And it can also be um, Wendell Berry, you know, my favorite poem of his is uh, uh, the Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front, um, where, he, where he says, um, as long as uh, women don't go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman giving, near to giving birth? And it's like this quiet rumble of what you think is important is not what's important. Align yourself to the things that are real. Yeah. And poetry does that. Good music does that. Good art right. does that, period. Right. But I do feel like we've sort of lost a cultural understanding of the way that poetry can rock your world. Yes. If you, if you encounter the right poem or the right poet at the right time. And it's, I, I think a big part of the problem is that... Um, we, when we begin to read poems, we worry too much about what they mean. Or whether, we're, whether we can understand it. Whether we can understand it instead of yeah. trying to experience what does it. Do it. Because, yeah. you know, it's like if we went to, if we went to a, a, a symphony tonight, we went to a Brahms symphony, mm -hmm. and we walked out afterward, and I said, hey, Brandon, what do you think that meant? You'd be like, that's a question that doesn't even make any sense. Right. You know, or if I said, did you understand that? Yeah. Say, that's ridiculous. But if I said, what was the, what was the experience of that for you? Or how did that make you feel? Or, yeah. you, you know, you, there, there are questions that make, that make a kind of sense to ask that have nothing to do with um, deciphering yeah. a Breaking meaning. Breaking some code, yeah. Yeah. Because poems are not secret codes. Right. Poems, uh, you know, a poem doesn't need an explanation. A poem is its own explanation. Did it make you feel something or didn't it? Did it make you feel something or didn't it? And, you know, a lot of poems don't. Sure. Um, but there are some that will. Right. You know? Um, and I think, I mean, I do think it's part of why I go back and forth about uh, reading actual poetry readings uh -huh. generally because they they can be dreadful um which is the thing that happens very often in the poetry world that the rest of the world knows nothing about knows nothing about that there are regularly gatherings of poets where they read their poetry together to each other that's right yeah and i i go back and forth about it because i think i sometimes i i feel like oh it's it's just it's dreadful we're sort of preaching to the choir we're like reading to other poets on the other hand though i do think that you know my first experience with poetry, right, wasn't on the page. It was in the air. Mm -hmm. It was out of someone else's mouth. And it wasn't even the poet who'd written the poem. It was a representation some of other yeah. guy yeah. who had been floored by this poem and wanted to read it mm -hmm. out loud. And there's something about reading a poem out loud that allows you to experience the poem as music first. Yeah. Or as sound first, as 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 a as a as a barrage of feeling, that um, maybe it's harder to get sometimes on the page. And I mean, you know, I think about my poems as being they're they're different. The the poems on the page are not the same as the poems when I read them. Sure. They're like different animals. Yeah. Um, there's something else that the voice that the body brings to the poem that's not on the printed page and yet on the printed page there are other delights there are other ways of like thinking about sure uh and engaging with that that language but i think that sometimes for a lot of people it takes hearing poetry experiencing and 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 maybe even hearing hearing someone talk about poems um 
in a way that's that's engaging and not that, that doesn't make people feel like they're stupid, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I always say to my students, like, you, if you see it, it's there. If you feel it, it's there. Describe that. Like, articulate that. Mm. It's not about explaining anything, and it's not about interpreting anything. It's about describing everything as hard as you can. Mm-hmm. It's about paying attention. I mean, one of, my, one of my teachers in graduate school said, we are largely defined by the things that we choose to ignore, mm-hmm. which is terrifying because that's mostly everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the things we choose to pay attention to are few, few and far between. And, and we, I, I feel like, I wonder how much energy that our brains use blocking stuff out and ignoring Just things. filtering. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like tune into the noise, you know, <laughs> tune into the noise and the invisible will Stop like blocking it rise up. to the surface. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, obviously we could talk about like this is conversation number two over over more beers. I do want to talk about your work. And so um, we've talked about the fact that people don't, um, and I'm making assumptions and they're not going to be true of everybody, but culturally there is not an awareness of poetry. And in the same vein, there is not an awareness of poets and there is not an awareness of what it takes to do the work that you do both as an academic and as a, and as a poet. So I want to talk a little bit about just how you spend your days, um, what it means to teach poetry, what it means to continually work on a craft, um, so give me, give me, first of all, a sense of your average day. I know the days differ. I know there are days where you're traveling and you're reading. But a day at the Art Academy of Cincinnati, who are you teaching? What is your day? How does your day break down? What are the, what are the typical experiences? Well, okay. So first thing I should tell you is that I have written a poem every single day of 2017. Okay. Um, is that, do you do that? Is that... It's a discipline. Is it something you've done in past years? No, it's, I, I, I did that for 2017, okay. part, partly because I wanted to reconnect with the process of writing poems. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't want to think about publication. You didn't want to think about editing. I didn't want to think about revising anything. So I, I type a poem every morning. I have like seven or eight manual typewriters, but the one I've been using mostly is my Remington Portable Number no. 7 from 1949. <laughs> um, was this influenced? You, the one thing we haven't talked about is the, uh, and I'm forgetting the actual name of it. The, you started this thing in Cincinnati where you set up and you write immediate poems for people in real life, in real space. Yeah. What's it I, called? The, it's, it was called Poems While You Wait. Okay, right. Yeah, which I got from, I, I have to say, I got from, uh, there's a Chicago chapter of Poems While You Wait, and I got invited to type with them okay. one afternoon, and I did that, and then I asked... Uh, the poet Kathleen Rooney, who heads that up, if we could do it in Cincinnati, and she was like, "Yeah, of course." Okay. Um, so we're sort of the Cincinnati chapter of, nice. of poems while you wait. Did but, that influence your desire to just be putting? Because that's a lot of pressure. You step up to somebody. You're sitting at a table. You're. I saw you at an event uh, at the Art Academy. You knocked out a poem. It was great. I have it. It's up on the wall at my desk at home. Um, they're not tossed off poems by any means. There's good thought and, and emotion that goes into those. Anyway, I guess my question is, did that lead you to f- be focusing on your creative output more? No, I, I've, always, I've always typed poems on a typewriter. Okay. Um, I have, I, I like the typewriter because I can't revise as I go. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like I have to put, whatever I put down is there. I can exit out, but I still have to contend with the fact that I exited out. Yeah. Like it's still on there, there and it keeps me sort of focused. Whereas if I'm handwriting something, I can, I can drift off in the clouds and sort of stop. And yeah. if I'm typing on a, on a computer, I just start editing things before they're anything and it's dead. Right. So working a typewriter allows me to sort of keep going. Um, and we could talk more about Palms While You Wait. I mean, I, 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 that has become such an amazing sort of teaching tool. Like mm-hmm. the students who do that get so much out of the fact that People, for people who don't know, right, people come up to us and they give us a topic. Right. So it's their topic. It's what they want the poem. Typically, you sign up in a notebook because you guys are, are working 
you put your name down and you put your topic down. That's right. You're not having a conversation with the person. You're not getting a bunch of context. Right. Sometimes, okay. though, we do ask questions and, and okay. that language winds up in the poems. But, but we write a poem for somebody else. They come back and we read it to them mm -hmm. on the spot. And it allows for this, this interaction, this connection to occur between two people over one poem. Hmm. And, it, and the poems that I write are not my poems. They're, they're your poems. They're the poems that somebody else asked for, right? And it, I think it, it reminds people sometimes that poems can be powerful and not just at weddings and funerals. Yeah. Um, that, that it can be an event, that they are events. So I've written a poem every day of 2017. When I, I type the poem, uh, the parameters they gave myself, they, they had to be at least 14 lines. Most of them are, um, because that's the length of a sonnet, but, yep. but they, uh, most of them are a page, page and a half, two pages. Some of them are three pages long. Uh, and then when I finish the poem, I make any notes on it that I want to make, things I want to remember, stuff I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. I date it at the top. I put it face down on the desk, and I'm not allowed to look at any of them until 2018. So wow. we're coming up on the moment when I can actually go back and yeah. start looking at them, which is my typical process would be if I wrote something and I was interested in it, excited about it, I would immediately start working on it. Yeah, yeah. You start revising it, start i got to get whatever. this out to the people. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had a whole year where I've written poems every day and haven't looked at them. That's fun. Haven't edited them or done anything. Yeah. But, uh, and I've written more than one some days. So mm -hmm. like today was number 364. So tomorrow will be 365 okay. poems. Do you do them at a certain time every day? I've been doing them usually in the morning. So I get it pretty early. So I've been doing them usually in the morning, but sometimes things happen and I do them in the afternoon or there have been a few that I've done in the evening. Sometimes I'm out of town. So I've tried to borrow borrowed typewriters from people when I've been out of town. <laughs> uh -huh. A couple of times I traveled with a typewriter so that I could do it. Nice. But um, I haven't missed a day. Nice. Which has been, and I feel like I could just keep doing it. And the thing, the, the thing I love about it, again, is like, it's allowed me to reconnect with the process. The, and, and to remember, like, what do I enjoy about poetry? Mm -hmm. Well, I enjoy writing poems. I enjoy, like, rooting around in the, in, the, in the mess of the world and the mess of sort of being and like seeing what's there. Like that's, that's literally sort of what gets me up in the morning. Like, and I don't, um, the rest of it, the, the business of it, the, the publishing and, and even doing lots of readings and all that kind of stuff is not, it's not where it's at yeah. for me. So it's allowed me to reconnect with that. But typically I get up, write a poem, uh, then I, I go upstairs and hang out with my family for a little while, and my, uh, my wife Melanie, is a, she teaches at SCPA, so she's an art okay. teacher there. Uh -huh. um, my daughter Agnes is in sixth grade, um, and you know, we, I go to school and um, it smells like oil paint, and uh, it's, you know, we have these big, boomy, uh, this big boomy ventilation system. It's this old, like really super industrial yeah. building with lots of concrete. And there's, there's just, you know, there's noise everywhere. There's sort of a mess everywhere. My students are the most amazing. And I say this with all great affection, the most amazing weirdos you'll ever meet. You know, yeah. I mean, these are the people that like can literally like reinvent yeah. the world. And, and er, like, there's got to be something really neat about seeing in art school, seeing that crop of 18, 19, 20 year olds come in who know they want to do something special, who have no idea even who they are at this point and who are going to go out and some of them just do absolutely amazing things and getting to make a mark. Yeah, they do amazing them. things and, <clears throat> and not just like art things. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even think that like the, the goal of an art education or the goal of like getting a BFA in college is because you want to go and be an artist. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a, it's a creative degree that allows you to deal imaginatively with any material, any context, any problem, 
mm-hmm. that you ever encounter in your life. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to handle anything you confront in only the way that you can. Yeah. You know, out of your own unique experience, your own unique brain, your own unique weirdness. And that's what the world needs. We don't need people looking at the same problems over and over again in the same light, in the same ways, with the same materials. Mm-hmm. We need people who are willing to like explode the possibilities of the way things might be rather than the way that things are. And that's what a BFA in creative writing or painting or photography or whatever allows you to do. So we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about imagination, talking about um, materials themselves, uh, the ways that they can be used and misused to create effects. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, one way to use a hammer is to hold it by the handle and like pound something with it. Another way to use it might be to nail the hammer into the wall. Right. Um, So, and you know, that's a sort of ridiculous example, but I do think that like, we all, you know, including me, have um, lots of notions about the way that things are and the way things should be and the ways that they've always been. And sometimes the solution to a problem is in imagining it in an entirely different way, trying something ridiculous that you think won't work. I mean, I think about... uh, There's a lyric that I often quote by the punk man Jawbreaker, Mm -hmm. which says, I believe in desperate acts, the kind that made me look stupid. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that's a kind of mantra for me. Like I want my students to like walk away from their classes, realizing that sometimes doing the thing that looks stupid is exactly the thing that's called for. And it is that, that your error is, in fact, your success. And that in that error is where we find genius. Mm-hmm. It's like where change lives. If we, can, if we can just, like, allow ourselves to see it. Free yourself up to that a little bit. As a, as a teacher in an academic environment, are you... I don't get the sense that you set out at any point to say, I'm going to, I'm going to be a teacher in an academic environment. No. So are you, what informs most you as teacher? Um, uh, you, you know, Matt poet, creative person, creating creative output, um, uh, you know, punk rock. Yeah. Like energy. Right. Um, uh, that, that evangelical sense of like, I want to, I want to peel people's the scales off people's eyes yeah. and cause them to stare at the things that matter most. Like what is informing how you bring yourself into the classroom every day? All of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> teaching is a performance every day mm-hmm. and you have an audience there and it's not about entertaining them. It's about engaging them. It's about finding a way to make them startled. Mm. Um, so the punk rock, that sort of hellfire and brimstone preaching, the, the art itself. I mean, I don't think of my poetry, and this is something I should, should have said earlier, is that I don't, I don't think of my poetry and my life as separate things. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are, they're part of the same fabric. Like, I'm always thinking about, I'm always writing poems. I mean, this might wind up as a poem. Right. Anything, everybody who knows me knows that like anything that, that, that happens in my life might very well wind up in a poem somehow yeah. uh, or might inspire a poem or, or, prov- or provoke me in some way. So, you know, I think part of my job as a, as a teacher at an art school is to be alive in art all the time and to demonstrate that but also to help my students understand for themselves what it is to be alive in their art which is not the same as what it is to be alive in mine um the the poet richard hugo said something like you know 
he would he would tell his students at the beginning of a, of a poetry class and say, you know, if if we're really lucky here, uh, by the end of this course, you will see your way through all my bullshit so that you can figure out something about who you are as a poet. <laughs> because, I mean, it is, it is really, there's something really magical and really sort of mystical about teaching poetry or teaching art of any kind because I can actually only tell you what I would do. Right. I can tell you, and, and that's based on, you know, my experience, what I've read, things that have worked for me. But if you only do those things, then you're going to wind up doing something derivative. So you've got to find a way to like do the thing that I could never predict. And that is one of the most magical and most difficult and hardest things uh, for the students mm -hmm. and, and, for, and for, for me as a faculty member to sort of grapple with every day is that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis that's placed on having sort of course goals and having sort of learner outcomes that are that are measurable right. and and predictable but in an art context the, the thing that you want is for someone to do the thing you never could have predicted yeah and if they do that they have succeeded. <laughs> you know, they make you see to, art in a totally different way. How to measure and way. grade and quantify them yeah. for, for doing that. Oh, <laughs> and um, it's so exciting. So anyway. um, sometimes we talk about um, like the path that people take uh, broad strokes. Some people know what they want to do from an early age and they just do it. Yeah. Other people stumble along. Maybe they find it, maybe they don't. Other people weave their way through something that, that, that uh, in retrospect seems inevitable. Um, could you have ever done anything else? I mean, this seems as much as anybody I've ever spoken to to be, to be the true thing that you are. It could have come out in different ways. You could, you know, you could be traveling the world, still singing for punk bands, but yeah. I'm interested to know what you, what you think about sort of the arc of that, at least in as much um, retrospect as you have right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it, it and, and here's the let me let me interrupt you. Here's the yeah. reason I ask is because one of the things I want this podcast to do is for people that are asking that question and feeling like they can't find it. Right. Like I want them to hear somebody else answer that. Yeah. And say, well, fuck, I don't know. Like, or, you know, <laughs> whatever that answer is. Yeah. I here's the thing. I have always done ever and only what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that, that like excited me, the thing that I was super passionate about, uh, I, and, and as a result, yeah, I do feel like the person I've become was, was inevitable mm -hmm. because I didn't, um, allow myself to be swayed uh, by anything that I didn't feel in my heart was the thing that I actually wanted to do. I mean, Where I run into students all the time, for example, who like want to go to art school because they, uh, they're good at drawing or something. Um, and they think that like, well, maybe I could get a job. Like I, I have to get a job. This is my route to a career. This is my route to a career. Um, and I think like, I, I understand that totally. Like I understand why that's so, that's such a powerful like magnet for students. But, but then, you know, when, when I actually say like, well, so what do you love about design? You know, because that's what they want to do. They want to do design or illustration mm -hmm. or something. They say, well, I think I could get a job. I'm like, well, what would you do if you could do anything? Well, I'd be a painter. Well, then be a painter. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, I don't, the, the value of a college education is not the amount of money you can make on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. it, it, can't, it. It can't be about that. If it is, then it's not about getting the education that you need. You know, and it's like, I feel like I was defiant enough to get the education that I needed, mm -hmm. even though I didn't, I, 
very often I didn't know what that was. But, I, but I'm so antagonistic to authority. <laughs> Well, that was gonna be that was gonna be my question. Is it's fine to say like, no, I wouldn't. You know, d w that doesn't sound to me like it was a message that somebody drummed into your head right. early on that said, Matt, don't don't ever give up on your dream. It right. sounds to me like it was you saying, damn it, I am gonna do what I want to do. I don't care what any of the rest of you want me to do. Is right. did that come from inside you or from or from some message? Yeah, it, I guess it came from, from inside me, Dead or it Kennedy's came from records. yeah, maybe it came from the it came from. Uh, not being willing to do the things that I was supposed to do. Yeah. You know, the, 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 I always I say to my students, <laughs> always do the opposite of anything I tell you. <laughs> and I think... Um, do they do it? Very often, yeah, they okay. do. Uh, they are rebellious spirits. But I think um, that's always been something that's been in my own head. It's like the moment somebody told me to do something, I would... I would say, you know, I would think about whether or not doing the opposite would be better mm. for me right on. Or, or not doing it at all would be better for me. Um, you know, it's like I've been editing this journal, Forklift Ohio, yeah, yeah. a journal of poetry, cooking, and light industrial safety for the last 25 <laughs> years. And, you know, we still hand make mm -hmm. every issue. We do three or 400 copies of each one. And I was doing that. I was making an issue last weekend with my friend Mike mm -hmm. and we're and we're I looked up at him at one point I was like dude we've been doing this for 25 like the same way we've been doing this for 25 years yeah with our with our friend Eric and like we've been doing this the same way even though along the way people have said like oh you could get you could get you could apply for this grant and get it or you could do you could do it this way or you could make this more of what it is. or You could have like distribution. It's like, we don't, that's not what we wanted to do. Right. We want to do this. You wanted to make a thing together. We want to make this thing together. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the, in the way that we can, um, and in a way that keeps us excited and surprised. And, you know, 25 years later, we have, we still have a literary journal that's going that's like, and it's ridiculous, but it's awesome. And you're still into doing it. And maybe maybe totally the most important it. thing is you actually still want to do it. We when still it comes want around. to do it. Yeah. We still want to do it. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I can't, like you've, you've quoted a couple of poems. I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I, I don't want, because the experience of your poetry for me is so central to hearing you read it. Um, I have a copy of your book, Radiant Companion. Um, I would love to hear, hear one of your poems, whether it's you reading something out of this or uh, actually I want to take the constraint. I just want to hear you read or recite a poem that is whatever you want to do, whether it's one of yours or not, whether it comes from this book or not, if you'd be willing. Yeah, of course. Is there something in there that you, want, that you would like for me to read? Um, the one I was, uh, was just reading before you showed up was Poem with a Chorus by Jawbreaker. Oh. Um, Largely just because I think it's interesting how, how your obvious influence, like you're pulling other things into there. You were talking about how you're writing poems about the real world. Right. And that's one of those poems. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. what, are you, what are you most excited so, to? I'll totally read that. Okay. Sure. All right. Poem with a chorus by Jawbreaker. The word is pain. And the world is pain, but the sun on our skin is enormous and light. I went out running this morning the way I always do, awkwardly with lightning. And at some point, I thought about the song Chesterfield King by Jawbreaker, which is a punk rock conversation poem in the romantic tradition if ever one existed after Coleridge and Wordsworth made it a thing then abandoned it. The chorus goes, I took my car and drove it down the hill by your house. I drove so fast. The wind, it couldn't cool me down. I turned it around and came back up. You were waiting on your steps, steam showing off your breath and water in your eyes. We pull each other into one, Parker's clinging on the lawn. 
and kiss right there. Stanza breaks her mind. I don't know why I thought about that then or why I'm thinking about it now, except that it's a song you should know if you don't already. And it has a fragility to it, a vulnerability in its lion flaming punk rock heart that reminds me of your poems and how longing never leaves us as long as we live, which is lucky and even better. I'm suddenly struck by the image of a rowboat on the sunset horizon with one lonely figure rowing into the distance out to sea. And in this image, which is really the world, I'd like to call out to the figure in the boat, to the him or the her, who is probably you or me or someone just like us, someone in need, but they're too far away to hear me or I'm too far away to hear me. And yet, that doesn't mean I shouldn't scream and scream to try and get their attention because attention connects us and generates possibilities. And possibilities are the stitches that we use to close the wounds, the ones that we inflict and the ones inflicted on us. Yeah, the world is pain, but attention is rich, and connection changes everything when we allow it to sing us. The sun going down, so light and enormous. The pink and orange waves, their marvelous chorus. I took my car and drove it down the hill by your house. I drove so fast. You took your boat and rowed it out, both to listen and mend. I'm standing here, hoping to get your attention. Longing for its own sake is a letter close to heaven. Longing in words continue the world. Wow. Matt Hart is an associate professor of creative writing and the chair of the Department of Liberal Arts at the Art Academy of Cincinnati. Uh, he's also the publisher and one of the founders of Forklift Ohio, a poetry journal, among other things. Matt, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Really, this has been a joy for me. Thanks. Really yeah, appreciate I it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. This episode of The Distiller Podcast was recorded live at Westside Brewing, 3044 Harrison Avenue in Cincinnati. Thanks again to Matt Hart for joining us on the show. For more information about Matt's work for the Art Academy of Cincinnati, his journal, Forklift Ohio, and links to some of his poems, visit thedistillerpodcast.com and click on the more info links for this episode. Special thanks to Jim and Curtis Remmel of Westside Brewing for hosting us. Stop by the brewery, taste the Session IPA or the Double. They're delicious. And check out westsidebrewing.com for events including Dog Friendly Wednesdays every Wednesday night. The Distiller is produced, recorded, and hosted by me, Brandon Dawson, with co-production and booking from Terry Heist. We are mixed by Justin Golden. Our logo was designed by Scott Ryan. You can find The Distiller on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also download episodes, find links and info, including photos of the guests and locations, and get in touch with us at thedistillerpodcast.com including to suggest people you think should be on the stiller to talk about their search for meaningful work, or if you think there's somewhere interesting we should record the show, or something interesting we should drink while doing it. It's all at thedistillerpodcast.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.